everyone. It's Kim from Fleece and Harmony. This is our knitting podcast recorded in, on our sheep farm in Belfast, Prince Edward Island, Canada. This is episode 78. If you're joining us for the first time, this is a podcast about our farm life and my knitting life. And we own a woolen mill, so are my spinning wool making life as well. We, if you've been here before, then you know what to expect. This could go anywhere in any direction, <laughs> any direction. But we'll try to keep to the agenda today. So today we're going to talk about the farm update as usual. Um, I have some uh, whip, the same whip that I've been showing for a couple weeks now or a couple podcasts. No rips, so that's great. That's good news. Nothing that I, has been ri ri ripped out. And I'm also showing an FO again. It's a little bit of a cheat because it's not my own FO. It's uh, Jennifer Hicks FO and she's uh, working here in the mill with us. So I'm going to show her um, her project that she worked on with uh, one of our yarns. We also have quite a, um, we have a, an update on the Kate Davies knit along that we're doing. So we'll talk about that. My whip is actually my project for the Kate Davies knit along. And we have quite a long shop update because there's a lot going on right now. Everything's gearing up for sweater weather coming sometime, even though today is just a beautiful, beautiful summer day here. So, but it's uh, not too early to start talking about what we're gonna knit for winter. And I also have an in the mill segment closer to the end of the podcast. And uh, today we're going to be talking about another preparation step. And it's the last step before we get to spinning. And we are going to do part two of the harmony part that we started in the last episode. And this is the walk down Portree Road. So um, we'll get started with the farm update. So if you've been following along, we've been talking about the weather and this, the weather that we would have dreamed of having in the last three years. We got this year, but it came a little bit at the wrong time because it came right when people should have been making hay. So the irony of the weather on Prince Edward Island in the eastern part of Canada right now is that we're having a few days of sunshine, a few days of rain, which is perfect growing conditions for most things. But if you're trying to make hay, it's a little bit of a nightmare because it, uh, you need at least three days without any rain to allow your hay to dry out properly so it cures properly in the barn. So everybody is behind um, cutting their hay. People that cut the first cut of hay, so if they were early enough in June to cut their hay, they've got lots of hay. And right now there's lots of hay around, but what they're cutting now is not really that great quality. Um, it's better than having no hay, but it does have a tendency to be a bit dusty if it hasn't dried out enough. So um, now people are a little bit worried about that depending on what kind of animals they're feeding. For us, we are worried about what sheep like to eat and we had a 26 acre field that is planted in um, forage for our sheep. And um, as you know, if you've been following, the uh, farmer that cuts our hay for us wasn't able to get to the field to cut it. So he finally got there last week and took a look at the hay and it's not really going to be good um, it's not going to be really good for sheep. Sheep need a high protein hay and this is overgrown obviously because it should have been cut uh, really really early in July and it's way overgrown so it's too um, tough and not enough protein for the sheep. So we could sell it to farmers that are have um, beef cattle but there's enough hay around for them this year so there's a little bit of a glut of that kind of hay. So it's not worth it for us to cut it and wrap it and bale it and try, try to store it. So what we decided to do is that the hay was cut in the field. It's left on the field to dry. And then um, the farmer that makes our hay is going to come back and turn it over again to make sure it really dries out. And basically we've got compost for the field. So it'll just stay in the field like that and go back into the soil. And it's not... Um, obviously not the best case scenario but these are the kind of decisions that farmers have to make it's actually less expensive for us to do that and buy the hay that we're going to need this year than to go to the trouble and wrap that hay and uh, do all the preparation and that's the most expensive part of what we we do in haymaking 
Um, we have, uh, you can make haylage, so it doesn't need to be as dry as dry hay, but there's a plastic wrap that goes around that and it actually ferments the hay it, over the, the fall and into the winter. And that um, wrap that goes around is really expensive. So the most economical thing to do, weighing everything in the balance, is just to leave the hay on the field just making sure that it's turned over and, and dried and not staying in the same place. And then the new um, hay will grow up, uh, and the, the plants will grow up underneath it. And next year we'll have a field that's been, has a little bit of mulch on it. And um, it's the best, the best case scenario. So the good news is, is that the farmer that makes our hay has enough hay for us to buy to feed our animals, the horses and the sheep and um, we're just going to rest our field for a year so <laughs> that's what's happened with our hay now in the west of canada if you're not uh if you're not um, watching from canada the situation is pretty dire it's they're having a drought in the western part of canada and then even further west like in alberta and bc the forest fires are just it's completely horrendous what everybody's dealing with there and um, I'm watching the news every night. People are having to move their um, animals out of uh, evacuation zones. So you can imagine the list logistics of that. It's, it's a really kind of a really rough situation. Um, but because we have so much hay here, the Department of, um, or the Federation of Agriculture here is actually organizing um, a shipment of hay to go out west. So those uh, farmers will get some of our hay um, not our personally our hay, but pay from PEI and Nova Scotia and other places in more eastern in Canada, and uh, they will ship it out to the west for the farmers out there that will need to feed their their animals. So we're really thinking about those folks every day, and um, you know the problems that we have here with cutting hay and leaving it on the field even is really small potatoes next to what uh, what those farmers are dealing with in the in the western part of North America actually because I think it's extending down to the states the same kind of conditions so that's uh, you know life on the farm as we said you know has you if you've been following for a, a long time you know that it's not always easy um, but it's still uh, you know still a very satisfying life but you have problems that you have to solve all the time it's a problem solving type of job being a farmer everything else on the farm though is great i mean our animals are all really healthy um, the one good thing about the um, weather situation here this year is that if you're feeding on grass live grass then there's so much grass that it's crazy the sheep are like i said before very happy and um, we're hardly having to move them at all because the they can't eat the grass fast enough so they graze over one part of the field and by the time we uh, they shift around and go to another part of the field and they come back to where they were before it's already grown up again so it's really good for if you're doing grass um, fed animals that you're not uh, having to give them dry hay so that's what's happening and the same in the horse pasture as well they can't they can't eat it fast enough so it's that's the positive and the other positive is that it will um, also allow us to graze the animals outside on the field well into the fall which will take the pressure off of our hay and we talked about that last uh, last podcast so it's uh, you know there's pros and cons of uh, of everything in life and that's uh, that's what we're dealing with uh, this year today however is such a beautiful perfect sunny day it's so um, you just have to be grateful for these kind of days. It's the sky is blue. There's a little bit of a breeze. The humid, there's not too much humidity and it's just beautiful and just a day to be thankful that you're, that you're living in a place where you're, where you're safe and, and, um, you know, relatively comfortable. So we give, uh, we're really grateful for that. So we'll get to the knitting part now. And uh, the only whip that I'm going to show again is my even dune pat my even dune sweater that I'm knitting for the Kate Davies cal uh, or knit along. The uh, paisley is still hibernating because I really want to be working on this uh, this sweater that I love. So I'm just going to reach over here and get it. So I've uh, I was away for three days. It was my father's uh, 80th birthday last week. 
So I did take three days to um, go spend time with my parents. So I was there and I didn't get much knitting done. So I've been uh, working furiously on the last couple of days to, um, to get some more progress on my sweater. So the last time I showed it, it was really, um, it was, uh, it was up to here, this, this spot more or less. I'm just going to try to, the second uh, blue stripe is where, where it was. So I'm continuing on down and I'll just stretch this out. So as I'm knitting this, I'm getting a little worried about the yarn quantity that I have. So I thought I might actually be able to knit this sweater with one full skein of each of the colors and um, have enough yarn to do to do what I the length of the sweater that I want but I don't think I'm going to have enough with just one skein now. So some of you bought uh, full skeins and one of the gradient kits to make this. There's a few customers that did that. I think you're going to be fine. But I just weighed um, the balls of yarn that I have, what I have left, and counted the number of stripes that I have. And then I also have the sleeves to do. So this pattern is knit or is um, written to be a shorter sweater. So not, I wouldn't say exactly cropped, but it is a little bit shorter, like just below the waist. And uh, I want to do a sweater that's longer than that. So I think I'm going to have to break out a second skein of, um, of the yarns. And uh, because I do want to make, uh, make it a little bit longer because I also have to still uh, knit um, the, you pick up stitches around the neck and knit the neck separately. And that's going to be in the pink stripe, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's the pink stripe. And um, if I do that and then do the sleeves, I'm not going to have enough, uh, enough um, uh, yarn in just one full skein of the Selkirk worsted for each of the stripes. So each stripe around is taking about 14 grams. And after I complete um, this series of stripes here uh, that, I'm, that I'm doing now, starting with the purple um, here, I probably want to do a full other repeat. Um, after I finish the repeat on this, this, uh, this section, I'll have about 36 grams left of my 80 gram ball. And then I still have to do, um, I want to do another, another whole section. So that would be down to what, 22 grams and I still have to do the sleeves. So it's going to be, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> so I'm going to have to get another ball, um, and some of these uh, some of these colors come in the gradient kit, so I'll use um, one of the the 50 yard balls from there. But uh, just so you know, and I'm knitting uh, size for bust size 41. So if you're trying to judge if any of you uh, want to knit the sweater, that'll give you a good indication of what kind of how much yarn you're going to need. And um, I wanted to talk about the raglan on um, the sweater a little bit because I had a question from the last podcast. So in the last podcast, I talked about the fact that I completed the raglan increases. So you're in, um, you're increasing um, uh, down the raglan line. And when I finished the increases for the raglan shaping, I had um, eight inches of um, sleeve, like the raglan depth was eight inches. So normally for me, an eight inch raglan de depth would be okay. And I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing the Ramia sweater today. This is a pattern by Jennifer Beale and it's knit in our lace yarn. So the main color is Mayflower and then you've got some color work with um, Vineyard, uh, amethyst brooch and autumn birch here but I wore this sweater because the raglan depth on this sweater is 8 inches so you can see on me that an 8 inch raglan depth fits me um, pretty perfectly if it's a sweater that's made to be fitted so this is um, it's uh, it comes to there the raglan depth for this sweater, I want it a little bit looser and a little bit more casual looking. So I wanted my raglan depth to be around eight and a half inches. So once I finished all of the increases, I had eight inches. So then I knit um, this pink stripe. I knit it uh, straight without doing any more increases either on the sleeve or the body. And somebody asked the question about why did I do that? So it's really just to give me that extra little, um, half inch or so under the arm 
but I'm doing it without doing any increases because I don't want extra bulk of fabric on my arms or on the body because the body is fitting me perfectly with the number of stitches that I had after I completed the raglan sh the shaping from the pattern and the sleeves are also per the perfect um, circumference. So I knit straight without doing any increases either on the body or the sleeve just to give me that little bit of extra length. So now my, my underarm raglan depth, if you want, is gonna be a half an inch longer than this sweater. So it'll just give me a little bit of extra room if I wanna wear a top, like a light top underneath this sweater. Um, because it's not, it's not necessarily, except in the middle of winter, a sweater that you would wear just as, um, as a, a top if you want. So that's why I did that. The other modification that I'm making on uh, this sweater, it's really super easy to do, is I'm adding a little bit of waist shaping. So this sweater is just, you knit stockinette straight down. And I've decided that I want to do a little bit of waist shaping. So I've done three sets of decreases under the arm. So I can, you can't really see it there because trying to make it look as invisible as possible but this is where I did it so under the arm you um, cast on your 12 stitches to make the underarm which you'll pick up later and in the middle of those 12 stitches I did a um, uh, knit two together and a slip slip knit um, so beside the middle the middle stitch so the very middle stitch of these 12 stitches which I know it's it's an even number so it's not really exactly in the middle but um, every time I'm two stitches away from from that uh, that middle row that I chose or the column that I chose I do a decrease on either side of it and then continue to knit so I did that three times and on both sides obviously on both underarms so I decreased um, the six stitches on one side and six stitches on the other so that's a decrease of 12 stitches and that actually removes about two to three inches of um, fabric from uh, from the waist area by the time I got down to the bottom so at, and I'll just tell you how I knew when and where to do those decreases I have a sweater that um, I use as my my sweater as far as my perfect fit sweater so it's a sweater that I purchased and um, it just fits me really well the length of it hits me right on at the hips where I like it the um, the sleeves are nice the the bust line fits perfectly and it has a little bit of waist, waist shaping in it and that waist shaping seems to hit me in the right place so um, if you have a sweater like that in your wardrobe, I would pull that out and use that as kind of a template for any of the adjustments you want to make on the sweaters that you're knitting for yourself. The, um, I did the measurements. So the measurements on that sweater are, it's a top, so it's not an outdoor sweater. It is like a, an indoor sweater, a top. So again, on that one, the raglan depth is eight inches, so I know that I'm making my raglan de depth a little bit uh, a little bit longer than that on this sweater. But from the underarm to the where their waist shaping in that sweater is the um, the smallest, it's seven inches from the underarm. So what I did was I started my I want to evenly space these decreases that I that I did, and I started it at the on a row where if I space them out evenly, the length of my sweater that I will have knit it is seven inches. So I'm just about there. I've just done the last decrease and um, I'm gonna have a couple rounds that are gonna be straight and I'll be at seven inches. So I know that this sweater will be, um, the waist shaping will be a bit, uh, will be right. Um, I also took into account that I increased the raglan depth here. So this, this um, cast on part of the underarm is a little bit lower than it is in this this sweater or the sweater that I use as my template so I've cut made all that um, and I mean it sounds like I'm doing a calculation but I'm just looking at it as I go and I'm measuring as I go because it's top down I'm able to do that so what I'm planning on doing now is the decreases are done 
I'm going to knit one or two stripes. I'll just see how, how it looks. And then I'm gonna to start to do the increases and I'll evenly space three sets of increases on either side at the same um, number of rows that I spaced them out here on when I did the decreases. So then by the time I get down to where I want to um, start knitting straight again, I should be, um, it should be at the top of my hips and I'm taking all this, these measurements from that template sweater. And I know my end measurement from the underarm is 14 inches because that's what my template sweater is. So I know how to do that. So it's just a, you know, arithmetic and figuring it out. And because it's top down, I can try it on as I go. And um, I should have the sweater with the fit that I, that I want. That's the plan anyway. <laughs> so, so, that's, uh, so that's that. So um, I'm just going to continue going with this. It's, it goes fast. It's very relaxing. There's a lot going on here uh, lately. So I'm really enjoying kind of this uh, more or less mindless knitting. I don't have to look at the pattern because it's just a straight shot other than what the modifications that I did myself in my head. So I know what I'm doing and I'm going to keep going with that. And, and um, after, I think I'll probably finish this before I pick up the Paisley again. So that's that. So um, I will talk a little bit about Kate Davies Knit Along now because I'm talking about my Kate Davies sweater because there's a couple things that I don't want to forget to mention. And then we'll go to the FO that I said I would show. So I had a couple people write to me and were asking if they knit one of the hats from the Milwaukee Head Heed's book if they that qualifies for the Kate Davies knit along because uh, Kate didn't design all of the patterns that are in that book. So for example, the Roman hat that I knit, I'll show a picture, is um, by Lynette Meek and but it's in that Milwaukee Heed book from Kate Davies. So I am saying that you can knit a hat from that pattern uh, book as well and enter it into the uh, the Kate Davies knit along because it's from a book that she published so you're okay to do that the other thing that I wanted to mention is that not to forget to post your finished objects in the thread on Ravelry or on our community forum that says finished objects I'm not going to go into the the chat um, that's happening on the progress the, and there's lots of stuff happening in those posts I'm not going to go into that that thread to pick the winner for the prizes that we have i'm going to go into the finished object thread so make sure that you're posting your finished objects in in the finished object thread after you finish um, and just to remind in case somebody is not aware of the knit along that we're doing we're doing a knit along celebrating kate's book 10 years in the making but you can knit any kate davies pattern that you want to join and you can knit as many patterns as you can get done. The end date is November 30th and you can use any yarn and uh, as long as it's a Kate Davies pattern out of one of her, her books or a Kate Davies self-published pattern, then um, that's, that's good. You can, you can enter with that. And to re, um, remind everybody about the prizes that we have, we have a set of Chiago Shorty needles. It's the blue set. So that's the set. I think it goes from 2.75 millimeters to five millimeters. Um, they generously um, donated that prize from uh, Estelle Yarns and Kier in Canada. And we have a Kate Davies uh, cowl. She has some knitwear that's been, is pre-made, like pre-finished knitwear that she sells on her website. And she's generously sent us one of those cows or sorry cowls <laughs> and we have that as a prize and we also have a knitting journal um, from kate davies that has her knitting um, knitting season logo on it so we're really excited about those three prizes that we have so you still have plenty of time it doesn't end until november 30th and uh, you can start your projects and get them in there and if you uh, there's some people that have already done a couple small projects as well so that's that's absolutely fine just make sure you're posting them in the finished object threads on either ravelry or in the community um, group that's on hosted on our website so there is a community forum there with a lot of different subjects that we've talked about 
So if you haven't joined that, you can um, you can join that by entering in through the uh, our, our website. You can join that community forum. There's a link at the bottom of the homepage to join that if you want to. So um, now I'll go back to the finished objects because I have a really cool project to show you. So this pattern is um, from Yelly Knits. So it's Y E L L E Y knits on Instagram the, her that's her uh, handle on Instagram and um, on Ravelry she's Yelly LD so Yelly with the initials LD after them and this um, is a bandana she's calling it um, it could be a shawlet I would say it's probably more of a shawlet but it is a small like a small shawl um, this was knit by Jennifer Hicks who works here in the mill and she used our point prim sock yarn for that and um, it's really cool because you have these lace uh, these little lace spots but you have the phases of the moon on the spine of the shawl uh, i think you can probably see that pretty well and the way that uh, jennifer hicks is wearing it is like this almost like a uh, like a kerchief so under under a coat is how she's planning to wear it you can make the uh, the shawlet a little bit bigger. Um, there um, there are instructions in the pattern that uh, allows you to do that. Tells you how you do it. So where do you find the pattern? Again, it's called the Blooming Moon Bandana by Yelly LD on Ravelry. It was designed for uh, an electronic uh, an ebook called the Sun and Fog Summer 2021 Meadow Collection that you, you can also find on Ravelry or you can buy this pattern separately from uh, Yelly LD as well. So the, it's knit with our sock yarn and the construction is really cool because what you do you start with a tab cast on like you would for many uh, many shawls and then you start your increases and you the modeling in the color of the yarns is because you're holding two yarns together and then when you knit along from from one side to the other when you get to the middle here where you have the phases of the moon you knit with a single strand and you do the color work so you separate the two strands that you're knitting together to create this um, this color work section in the middle so it's really cool and like i said you can expand it uh, a little bit the pattern um, this Chalette or bandana took one uh, one skein of the uh, each of the sock yarns that were used. So again, I'm going to skip around a little bit because uh, some of you that know our sock yarn are saying, "Well, wait a second, that looks like slate, that dark gray, and we don't have a sock yarn. That, <laughs> there's no point prim sock yarn in slate." So surprise, we actually have launched uh, three new colors of Point Prim sock yarn. So um, the other color in this is Seagull, the light gray that, that we've had uh, in the catalog for quite a long time. But the three new colors that we've launched are more neutral shades. So we have a lot of really bright, great colors in the Point Prim sock yarn that we make here. But now we're launching Slate, which is one of our best selling colors in the other yarns. It's going to give you a good look at that. And again, for people that don't know Point Prim sock yarn, this is a wool mohair blend. We don't do any, use uh, spin with any synthetic fibers in our mill. So this is uh, blended with 20% mohair for strength and uh, seven or sorry, 80% wool. So for people that don't know our yarns very well yet, the wool that we spin our yarns out of is all sourced from Prince Edward Island from our own farm and three other farms here on the island where we know the farmers. So we are spinning uh, their wool into our yarns and the mohair is Canadian mohair. We buy it from Ontario. So it's all um, Canadian sourced and we spin all of our yarns in the natural color and then hand dye all the skeins using using greener shade dyes which are uh, acid dyes but they're they're certified organic so that's what we that's how we make the yarn and you'll see if you stay tuned for the mill sections you'll see the whole process so this is slate 
and so that adds another neutral so for in those darker shades like that we have um, we now have slate we have a night without stars and we have rhubarb for red then um, we decided we wanted to add a brown so we chose chestnut which is a color that we make also in the worsted and the Aran, but it's just a lovely soft brown pretty neutral and um, we've now made that in point prim sock yarn so it's just delicious that's chestnut and then we decided to do a green and we've done fur so fur is a pretty neutral green as well it's also the green that's in the green gradient kit in our in our um, selkirk worsted yarns it's the it's the dark one in that kit but now we've introduced it in the sock so we're really happy to have these three shades and we um, looked at uh, the way that they go together and the way that they go with other um, with the other yarns that we have so um, that's something new that uh, you can purchase from our web store so that's uh, that's the part of the, the shop update the next thing that I wanted to talk about we're going to do a bit of a I'm kind of jumping around between the shop update and other things that we're talking about because of uh, just the way that the the items are in the in the shop update um, we're going to do a row and review on a new yarn so we're going to um, do a deep dive on a new yarn that Rowan launched last season so the Rowan review is on um, cotton wool cotton wool is a new yarn that Rowan released uh, last season for the spring and summer season we just received it um, just last week actually and there's 12 colors which are here I'm just gonna give you a good close look at those the 12 colors and um, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth so this is a 60% uh, cotton 40% wool yarn it's a chain at um, construction so you have the the um, there's a really close-up picture on our website if you want to look so um, when I've listed it on the website I've listed the colors with the ball band so you can see what yarn it is and then if you uh, roll your most mouse over the um, the the picture with the ball band then you'll get a close-up uh, picture so you can look at that and it's a super super soft um, yarn it's really really beautiful and the concept was from Rowan is that they wanted to create a yarn that could be used for um, for knitting for babies but also that the, the mothers could knit themselves something uh, or fathers could knit themselves something as well so the the concept is bloom so the book that came out with this yarn is called bloom and obviously making a reference to um, you know having a baby or you know and the way that you you bloom when you're when you're about to have a baby as well and it's really really soft as I said it's hand still hand washable um, because it does have have a lot of wool in it and it's not super wash but the texture of it is really really soft next to the skin and you can really use it for anything so um, the concept is with uh, babies and expectant moms but at the same you know, or dads and but at the same time you could really knit uh, anything uh, with it so the gauge is um, 20 stitches to four inches or 10 centimeters on four millimeter needles so that's a US size six uh, four millimeters is equal to a US size six 20 stitches to four inches or 10 centimeters and 28 rows so that's a pretty um, common gauge kind of a DK DK weight so you could substitute this yarn for other DK yarns the balls are 50 gram balls at 130 meters or 142 yards so that's um, specs on this wool it comes in 12 colors I'll just show them one more time all together so you've got a good variety of neutrals and um, soft shades and that's all up on the website right now um, the bloom book that features cotton wool was sold out so I'm just waiting for that to come in but you can see the patterns uh, online as well from from that collection 
and like I said, you could really um, use it to substitute for any any DK pattern if you want a really really soft yarn that's uh, has a really really soft handle. So that's in the in the shop. So the um, another wool um, in the shop uh, update that I will show. We talked about this in the last newsletter for the people that have subscribed to the newsletter they always get the first uh the first shot of purchasing these yarns um or is this group of colors just gonna give you a close-up look at that so these yarns were part of a wild uh flower kind of a flower collection that we did um a number of years ago one spring and you have, um, I'm just gonna take the ball bands off because it's easier to see. We have four colors that were used um, in that collection and they were only available in a yarn that we were making called Flock Fingering um, that we don't make anymore. So now we've um, put them on the worsted weight yarn. Sorry, I should have done, done this before I sat down. And the colors are Forget-Me-Nots. So you have this blue, blue and purpley tones. So forget me not. And you have um, buttercup, which has yellows and green tones. You can see that. And we have a purple one with some goldy tones, which is pansy. There. And we have the final one, which is called Wildflowers, which has just little, um, not really speckles, because we don't do like a dry speckle um, type of yarn, but you've got this um, colors with the yellows and oranges and blues all mixed. This is called wild, Wildflowers. So you can get them in Erin as well. We do dye this on Erin. I will say that um, on this worsted, we've done a little bit of, um, we've done a little bit less white space. So you'll see, if you go online to look at these, you'll see that on, on the Aran, there's a little bit more white on some of these um, yarns, but uh, the pictures that are for the Selkirk worsted are these exact skeins. So this is, this is, this is how this, it looks on, on the worsted. So that's available in the shop right now as well. The next big news for the shop is that our fall Rowan order is on its way. We're really excited. So the magazine for Rowan that's coming up is magazine number 70. And if anybody is a follower of Rowan, then you know that every time they come to the uh, even number of a decade, they do a special con excuse me, concept for their magazine. So 70 is um, pl the platinum anniversary and it's all about metallics and um, the designs are just fantastic there are so many patterns in this book that it's a bit crazy so i'll show the patterns over uh, the course of a few episodes because there's just so many to do a slideshow that we'd just be sitting here for an hour looking <laughs> looking at them so i'll break it up there's a couple stories um, as there is in every Rowan magazine like features so I'll break it up into the different features and the magazine is not for sale until September 1st but I it, they're on their way here so we'll ship them out on September 1st but I am going to put them up on the website so that you can order them as a pre-order just know that if you order yarn at the same time then your yarn won't be going out until um, September 1st but you know it's a it's you know short time to wait 10 days um, and then it'll it'll go out on uh, September 1st as I said so um, we're gonna do a little quick slideshow just to give you a little bit of a teaser and then as the episodes we go do a few more episodes I'll do more on this selection because the the fall and winter uh, pattern collection from Rowan is just fantastic so let's take a look at a few shots as a teaser and uh, we'll be right back
So it's beautiful. And I hope that you noticed something that I want to talk about is um, we've had a couple people ask, have commented um, that in the past that Rowan was maybe not as size inclusive as um, they could have been. And sometimes the patterns were stopping. They weren't graded up far enough or down far enough to encompass both ends of the spectrum. So I'm sure that you've noticed that they've made a, they, they, they made a commitment to the retailers actually a year ago that they were going to expand the range of sizes that they, that they were offering in their graded patterns. This is the first Rowan magazine that has showed what their efforts, um, their efforts were. So I'm pretty happy about the fact that they've, they've chosen to show, um, a lot of the patterns in two different sizes so you'll notice the models are two different sizes in some of them and um, then there's patterns that are, are um, just showing on slider models and then there's patterns showing at the other end of the, the, the range but they're all so beautifully done and uh, that, that grading has really uh, expanded for Rowan so I'm really happy to be able to present present that and to show what the the work that they've done so i would expect that this will just continue um this will continue as they they go through this process so um i hope that you're um, happy to see that as i was and you know it's always easier for people to imagine themselves in a pattern when the they can see themselves in in the photographs so the approach that Rowan has taken, I think, is uh, is to be commended because they they're showing both uh, both um, ends of that scale. So it's just uh, it's great. So we look forward to that. There's so many patterns in the book, as I said, that it's a it's just a bit nuts. It's like <laughs> there's going to be lots of choices, and um, there's like all kinds of new books coming out as well, which we're we've ordered all of them. So we'll get them in as they become available. And then there's more surprises to come in this winter season with Rowan. Um, there's a couple really uh, special projects that they're working on that are not going to be released until a little bit later. So the launch date for the magazine is September 1st, but then there's uh, other things that are going to be launching on October 1st, which I'll tell you about uh, as we get closer to that. So it's going to be an ex exciting time in the shop with Rowan and some other projects that we're planning as well with our yarns. We have a couple new patterns coming out from designers, some that you know already, and some new designers that uh, are working with our yarn. So we'll uh, look forward to a really fantastic uh, knitting season coming up in the fall. Okay, so this is gonna seem a bit choppy because when we turned off the video, I realized that I forgot to do an update on the Fiber Festival. So I recorded this after I finished the podcast and I'm gonna insert it wherever I found the place to insert it. So just to recap, the last time I told you, um, the last podcast, I told you that we were still, we're starting to talk about the Fiber Festival for 2022 and that we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to get the venue, the same venue at the PEI Convention Center that we had, which is the Marriott Hotel. And because it's PEI, we all still call it the Delta because it was the Delta before it was the Marriott. <laughs> Marriott so you might know by any of those names so the uh, Marriott has um, uh, confirmed that we have the dates uh, available that we wanted in the last week in, of September for the Fiber Festival for 2022 so those dates are September 23rd 24th and 25th so you can mark that on your calendars and um, the the Fiber Festival committee hasn't met yet but we will be meeting shortly to start um, planning and um, re uh, canvassing for vendors and uh, we'll be in touch with uh, all of the people that we're going to do workshops and see if they want to come in 2022 and uh, fill out so we'll be able to do more updates as time goes on so now we're going to go back to the regular podcast and um, we'll see you uh, see you there so I think that that's about all I wanted to talk about today. So we're coming to the end as far as what we're going to do here in the shop. Um, in the mill today, we're going to do the in the mill section and it is going to be um, showing a process that is right before we start the spinning. Um, it's done on a machine called the draw frame and you'll see how that works. So if you remember from the last episode, we ended with carding 
and we had um, the strips of wool coming out of the end of the carter called slivers or roving and those were on the big cans so now what we have to do is we have to take those cans and put them through another combing step on the draw frame so we're going to see how that uh, works so if you uh, just join me in the mill and we'll be back in a second Here we are at the draw frame. So what I'm doing here with this machine is I'm starting the drafting process, which will help even further organize the fibers. So as you recall from the other uh, stations that we've been, it was all about cleaning the fiber. And then when Jen was showing you about the carding, it was starting to um, organize the fi fiber so they're more or less parallel to each other and creating these rovings. So now the draw frame continues that same process. And we'll show you a little bit closer uh, here we're combining two streams of roving that came from the carter to get consistency in the yarn that we're going to have because there's always little bits of uh, difference in the in the fibers the amount of fibers that goes into each feed that jennifer showed you last time so we're combining two and it's all about getting more consistency and more organized uh, fiber stream so this machine i'll turn it on in a second when i'll stop talking this fiber stream goes through these roll set of rollers and comes to a drum that has pins on it that cards it even finer than what the carding machine does. And then when it comes out, you have a stream that goes directly behind the spinner, which we'll show you next time. And this is when this, the, we're right at the final set process before the spinning starts. Okay, so we're gonna start up the machine. I won't talk because it makes a little bit of noise and you're gonna see how the fiber is traveling out of the cans and into the machine on this end. It's a relatively slow process, and this bar helps to um, ease the fiber out of the out of the cans because as it comes to this process, it's getting a little bit more delicate uh, because it's getting thinner and thinner. Okay, so in a second, I'll turn on the machine, but you can see that the fiber stream now is thinner than it was when it went in because it's been stretched. Some of the drafting has already taken, and if I break apart this roving you can see that there's hardly any disorganization at all in the fiber stream. So it goes into these cans and then these cans go directly behind the spinner, which you'll see next time. So we'll just start the machine so you can see how it comes out. So there you have it. So the draw frame is the last step. Now we finally get to spin. So on the next uh, podcast, we'll show you the spinning and uh, you can see it's uh, people have been commenting that it's hard to believe how many steps there are so yes all of the all of the steps we've done so far is just to prepare the wool to be spun so it's in, it's incredible but uh, the the amount of different steps that have to be done but that's how you you do all the cleaning and straightening of the fibers and everything so when it comes from the draw frame it kind of organizes the fiber a little bit and we've talked about the difference between woolen and worsted yarns before not the size of the yarn but the process that goes into making them so just as a reminder worsted is um, spun the fiber is spun without being straightened out too much it's kind of all kind of um, jumbled if you want which makes a very um, lofty and warm yarn because there's lots of air places where air can be trapped in a worsted spun yarn or sorry in a woolen spun yarn in a worsted spun yarn the fibers need to be straightened out more so that they're all kind of in a parallel with each other and then when you apply the twist to that you get a yarn that's very smooth so if you think about a Harris tweed coat that's made out of a woolen spun processed yarn and you talk, think about a fine suit coat or business suit or a fine wool um, fabric that's made from a worsted spun yarn. So what we do in our mill is we make a semi worsted and the draw frame is a big part of that because that's kind of the final combing process that tr organizes um, organizes the fiber that little bit extra and then it goes to the spinner. So that's the inside scoop on that. Now we're going to talk about uh, Portree Road, Road again. So we gave a little um, uh, history lesson, if you want, of the Belfast area here where we live in PEI. 
and um, I showed you the wildflowers that were growing in the hedgerows, hedgerows down beside the Portree Road. Now we're going to show you a bit, a few clips that we took as we walked down and um, you, uh, you can just see uh, if everything goes by and as we approach the water on Portree Road. So we'll go for a walk and I hope you enjoyed the podcast. When, before we get to the harmony part, I'm going to say goodbye and um, thank you so much for all of the comments that you have left. Uh, I'm really happy that you enjoyed, um, enjoyed the music in the harmony part last time. A lot, a lot of people commented about the, the music. And um, if you like this video, I'll ask you to give me a thumbs up or give the video a thumbs up and remind you to subscribe. And if you want to know every time that we release a, a video for the podcast, or I'm also releasing tutorials from time to time on different things that technical things that we're talking about, you can um, click on the bell on YouTube and to get the notifications. So we will go to the harmony part and I hope you enjoy your next two weeks and everybody stay safe and uh, joyful. Bye. Thank you.